Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to this joint webinar between the Cyber Watching Project and the Sophie Project. Um, this is our 13th webinar as a Cyber, cyber Watching Project, and we're very pleased that um, Sophie, the Sophie Project, which is moving to an end, has is, is contacted us to, to do this little collaboration. And today, we'll be having a little deep dive into the IoT space. And uh, I think that the title of the, the webinar speaks for itself. Sophie looks at decentralized operation and security in the IoT space. So this is a space which is transforming our everyday lives and, and industry. Um, more and more devices are connected to the internet now and really improving the way that, 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 we, that we live and, and work. However, as, the, um, as things improve, so the attack surface also uh, gets more, more difficult and more challenging uh, and you know, more, more resilience, more authentication and more work to address privacy issues are, are clearly required. And these are all things which the, the Sophie project has, has looked at with some very interesting uh, use cases which they'll be talking about uh, today and also in in tackling you know the fr often fragmented area of IOT which can cause barriers to to uh, involvement by by market players so if you could move to the next slide please and um, I can see the numbers of participants growing I think we have just under 100 participants registered so I think people will be gradually joining us as we as we kick off you can see we've got a a, a packed couple of hours for you. Uh, we'll be hearing for, from, um, from George Polizos from uh, Athens University. And then a number, I'll not go through all the speakers, uh, obviously, because we don't have time, but uh, we've got a good variety of experts. So experts in the IoT area, experts in, in various topics regarding uh, IoT. And we'll also be, as I said, some of these, some of these use cases are very interesting, in particular on, on the, in the energy field and uh, in gaming as well. So um, there'll be time for questions and answers throughout the, the event. Uh, and, uh, and George will be, be managing them as I hand over to him uh, after this presentation. So uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, Cyberwatching Project. We're a project which looks to support uh, projects innovating in the cybersecurity uh, space. We, we help to map and cluster these projects and support them in the innovation pipeline as they become more uh, market aware, as they, they, uh, they work on their projects during uh, the project lifetime. The European Commission has funded uh, many projects in this area, uh, so it's right that there's a place where they can come together uh, and, uh, and be visible. Uh, next slide, please. And this is what we do. We, we, we help to cluster projects and map them. Uh, we have a project radar, which gives visibility, uh, a, well, a single entry point to, so you can see how projects uh, in the cybersecurity and privacy area uh, are, are mapped. And so you can get a vision of the landscape, support them in becoming more market and technology uh, ready. And then um, a single place, which is a marketplace for their, for their results. Next slide, please. This is our project radar, which many of you will have already seen, but uh, at the beginning of next month, we'll be launching a new interactive radar. There's 188 projects currently uh, um, mapped here uh, in different mapping categories. Our, our objective is to help cluster projects, avoid silos, uh, and, and get projects to work together. And you can see their lifetime is, uh, is shown visually. This is a great entry point for projects looking for collaboration and for also for policymakers and understanding the landscape and where potential gaps are. We're making this much more interactive. So you'll see a new look radar next month uh, where you can, projects are able to update and uh, upload their, their data here. Next slide, please. And it's, we also have a, a single area where projects can manage their own uh, their own web pages and I know that the Sophie project have done this very well so and many other projects we have over 175 little mini sites so there's a single place 
uh, where you can gain uh, you know, entry level information uh, for all the projects. Next slide, please. As I said, we also run workshops and webinars on supporting projects. So, you know, projects run, I don't know, two, three, four years with the EC funding uh, on the priorities that the, the Commission recognised for supporting the digital single market. Uh, and it's often projects deep, you know, really dive into the technology, uh, and uh, which is great, but um, more market readiness um, um, awareness is also required by projects. So we support, we support projects and we cluster them together to provide this, to understand uh, you know, how ready the market is for some of these uh, innovations that are coming out uh, of, uh, of EU research. Next slide, please. Finally, we have the marketplace. So this is where projects with results uh, can post them. So it's a single place where you know, the, the key exploitable results from projects are showcased and you can you can find these all online on the cyber watching project uh, and this is this is a a window for for the results from from eu funding next slide please and i also wanted to highlight some of the other projects which are working in this area you can see them listed here and you can find out more information about them on on the cyber watching website and you can go and find out also more information from their own individual websites a number of these are, are ongoing, like Confido and Privilege, and a number of have just finished or are finishing, and they publish their results, their key exploitable results in our, in our marketplace. And you can see there's a variety of topics which these projects address, uh, so, and you can really see the, the benefit of, of, uh, of IoT technologies on a number of different vertical sectors that we'll also hear about in the, in the workshop today. So with that, I'll hand over to George. Um, I think for, for questions, you should be putting your questions in the, in the uh, Q&A uh, box where the team can monitor them. And we, you know, as you said, as you saw in the agenda, we'll have time for questions and answers throughout the, the next two hours. So George, I'll hand over to you and uh, thank you very much and, and the rest of the, the Sophie team. Thank you and welcome everybody. Uh, let me uh, share my uh, my screen just a second. I'm uh, George Polizos from the Athens University of Economics and Business. And uh, I will try to uh, uh, position uh, Project Sophie in the IoT space and provide uh, an overview of the results uh, we are producing. Um, we have uh, devices, the numbers increase around us uh, all over. We are talking about uh, the Internet of Things and uh, in my view, the most uh, important aspect of it is uh, that characterizes is unattended operation. That is, devices operate and uh, communicate among themselves uh, as much as possible without human intervention, providing, of course, the services and serving uh, humanity but we are somehow uh, far from having this realized in particular in the form of the internet of things. And in our view, key uh, issues in this uh, area, in this domain is the fragmentation of uh, um, the IoT and uh, security and privacy concerns. So, Instead of actually having the IoT, we have silos. That is, most of the systems are vertically oriented closed systems. And this is mostly for non-purely technical reasons. Mostly uh, business and privacy and security concerns lead to separate systems that do not really interoperate and do not exchange data. Instead, we have a grand vision of 
the next fourth generation of business platforms of uh, IoT systems that would exchange data and perform actions across them in an automatic and controlled way. And we believe that smart contract on public blockchains can contribute this towards this, this, this goal. So blockchains provide decentralized trust and automation through smart contracts. There are different types of blockchains with very different characteristics and properties. And in order to take advantage of the best trade-off points among them, uh, we propose to uh, use at the same time multiple blockchains that support best in the best way uh, the properties uh, that we want and the goals that we want. And in order to achieve that, we need interledger technology. And our project develops and exploits uh, interledger technology and distributed ledgers in, in general in various uh, application domains. So the overall concept of uh, project uh, SOFI is, is the following. We have, or we, we contemplate many applications in many application areas uh, that will uh, base, that will exploit existing IoT platforms and autonomous things. And in order for them to take uh, full advantage of uh, existing platforms, they will need to um, get data and, and perform actions across many of them. And this will be facilitated by semantic interoperability and interledger transactions. And we have four key principles that we believe will, uh, um, will be uh, critical, will be central in the development of, of uh, such uh, uh, systems. Openness that leads to uh, large system expansion by including, by, by the inclusiveness property. Uh, federation that chooses loose interconnection rather than very rigid interconnection and allows very diverse systems to interoperate. Security that increases trust and guarantees the proper operation of the overall system. And data sovereignty that uh, provides the incentives for cooperation by allowing uh, companies, systems, people to control the use of their uh, data. So we have uh, proposed and now we are uh, running a Horizon 2020 project called SOFI, which stands for Secure Open Federation for Internet Everywhere that uh, exploits distributed ledger technology in order to securely and openly federate IoT platforms. And we don't do this uh, in the vacuum, but we take our examples and our problems for, from four specific uh, existing uh, application areas. And we have four pilots in these areas. Two of them in smart energy, one in Italy, balancing the electric grid with electric vehicles, one in Estonia with uh, smart meters exchanging data under controlled conditions, one in Greece with a food supply chain that guarantees uh, food provenance and other properties. And uh, in Finland, we have Rovio that experiments with uh, uh, context aware mobile gaming and uh, a full ecosystem around it. So we have partners from uh, those four countries, Finland, Estonia, Greece, and Italy. And we take advantage of the following key properties of uh, blockchains. Decentralized trust, 
immutability that guarantees interactions has uh, and availability because of uh, the uh, decentralization and the uh, robust uh, uh, storage of, of information and transparency which is a requirement for decentralized trust but on the other hand it uh, introduces issues with uh, privacy and, and business logic and therefore we propose to use uh, multiple ledgers some public that help with uh, decentralized trust and some private that help with privacy and business logic and in order to have them at the same time we use interledger technology which uh, allows the best trade-offs between uh, public ledgers and private ledgers public ledgers that have uh, uh, wide scale decentralized trust, full transparency, but have cost, overhead, and sometimes performance issues, and uh, private ledgers that uh, have uh, high scalability and performance can provide privacy, but have relatively limited uh, trust at the consortium level. And in addition, we're looking at uh, decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials, as you will see next, that improve privacy and availability. We have a federation architecture that I will not go into the details right now, but we can come back to it if we have time at the end. And we have a way of um, presenting uh, uh, an interledger uh, functionality all the way from uh, IoT devices all the way to full platforms. And you will see uh, subsets of, of this uh, schematic uh, used later on in, uh, in some of the uh, presentations. We can discuss the why, what, who, and how for interledgers maybe uh, at the end, but you will see many of these aspects discussed during the presentation that will follow. We can see today's or uh, very uh, near term uh, applications that can take advantage of this technology uh, and uh, provide um, a flexible, uh, futuristic and trusted operation. And for uh, the rest of this uh, webinar, my colleagues will uh, present various aspects of uh, our uh, technology developments and, and our uh, application areas. Santeri will discuss interledger approaches in IoT. Vasily Siris will discuss DIDs and verifiable credentials for constrained IoT devices. Preet will discuss the generation of secure energy services through the data exchange and Giuseppe marketplace for uh, flexibility in um, the power uh, network grid. Uh, Max then will uh, present uh, DLT and IoT use cases in mobile gaming and Spiros Vulgaris at the end will present a blockchain uh, architectures for uh, food supply chain management. So uh, I will come back at the end for a summary and conclusions. We have uh, a number of uh, publications that are shown. Some of them are here. Uh, that will be available with uh, the uh, slides uh, available at the end of the presentation. And uh, before thanking you and um, passing the baton, I would like to emphasize that uh, we are open to all kinds of collaboration and discussions in um, this area, either of the specific application domains we're uh, having in our pilots 
or the overall issues of decentralized trust and blockchains in the IoT domain. And um, I will stop here and uh, will uh, pass the baton to uh, Santeri. Thank you. Let me start my video and, and, and the screen sharing. Just a second. And that one should be the correct. Okay. Um, yeah, let's let me try to find the correct displays. I'm displacing myself. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's go to start. So uh, my name is Santeri Pavonen. I'm a PhD student at Aalto University. And I'm also at the uh, Ericsson, uh, Ericsson uh, as a software architect. So I'm working on this project from both the industry and the academic side. So what I'm going to talk about, my, my topic is essentially I'm looking at my research area is uh, researching into constraint devices, especially constraint IoT devices and the interaction with distributed ledgers. So my talk is, I mean, I'm going to talk too much about how to do interledger uh, specifically as a technological solution. There was, a, George mentioned the, the ILC interledger gateway that Sophie is providing. Um, that's one thing. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about how to use that, but why should you use that? And especially in the, in the scenarios of IoT areas. So I'm going to start first as, as a little background of, of what are the aspects when you consider it, what you need to think about IoT and blockchains, what's what's different in them from sort of using blockchains or DLTs or general case. And then on why to use interledger specifically in this case, and a little bit on, on, on the details of the how. So um the common problem, of course, with uh, DLTs and blockchains is why would you use them? Let's just assume that we have a reason to use them. Let's skip, skip the rationale for that. We may, we may say that because the bird says so. Um, that's often said that often the cases around, around using uh, the DLT are actually around uh, data exchanges, uh, control information passing, and various other stuff. I'm actually missing a, one pretty important screen for myself. I don't know where PowerPoint has hidden some of my displays. Okay, found it. Good. Um, yeah. Anyway, let's start with that. Uh, and uh, there's this. This is also from the research literature. So there's essentially four different ideas of how to integrate. IoT nodes, IoT devices into a blockchain network or a distributed ledger in general. The, the uh, most straightforward one that is, of course, the use of uh, the so called full node uh, integration pattern, where you have the IoT node as a full node in the blockchain DLT network. And the communication is just a standard full node value, uh, protocol where you transport new blocks, transactions, and the full node. The IoT device in this case would be normal validating now. And of course, that the important aspect of this is that it extends essentially the blockchain decentralization security properties to the IoT device in, in full. And that's of course a desirable property. The other approach is to use a sync client or a light client using a light protocol, which is uh, more suited to constraint uh, lightweight devices because it doesn't require full state storage. Uh, it has some properties uh, regarding security that are a bit less than on a blockchain network. This is actually an IE access paper I'm publishing uh, has been accepted that is discussing the security of light protocols in painstaking detail. But the idea is that while you get 
uh, sort of the security properties are extended, they turn into more probabilistic security properties than in the case of full nodes. So this is a valid integration pattern as well. There are constraints and k-values with that. Another integration pattern is to use a gateway. And the idea is that the gateway doesn't hide the idea that you have a blockchain network and, and the gateway retains some control of, of the operations. For example, using a Ethereum uh, JSON RPC API, while, where the gateway or the IoT device still retains control of, uh, of, of, of its private keys is would be a massive pattern. And of course, the problem here is that the the overlap between these trust domains or security domains is very slim at this point. And of course, you can also use IoT devices in a service map integration pattern where the, you have essentially a service that hides all of the details from the from the IoT device. And, this. and the, the cons uh, the cons of these is, of course, that in full node you have a large bandwidth processing and storage requirements, and these are often very problematic for constraint devices. If you, if you don't have uh, always on network, if you don't have uh, grid power all the time, you are maybe using a battery power, uh, you don't have gigabytes of storage, especially on public networks, but also on some pri uh, more private or consumption uh, blockchain technologies, these are problems. And, and the thin clients, while they have lessened bandwidth processing and storage, they often come with added increased complexity in the solution. And the most glaring obvious uh, problem with the, the other ones is that there is a trust boundary issue and trust loss of trust boundary for the service and gateway integration context. And, and from here we get why would we actually talk about interledger in the first place? Because the simplest way to solve this problem is not to trying to fit IoT device into the blockchain, but fit the blockchain to the IoT. And let's start with an sort of IoT friendly blockchain. Let's not get too much into how you actually do that because it's full of uh, trade off as well. The direct problem of that, of course, is the fact that most times uh, a widespread blockchain solution is not your choice of IoT friendly blockchain. And here is naturally how do you link that? And that's the point of doing interledger operations. And the rationale uh, for different business cases is different, but for, of course, for IoT devices uh, and especially constraint IoT devices, the main guiding principle of this is to be able to, to span this link uh, and, and get the IoT devices to be still part of the decentralized security in some manner. Of course, there's different technologies, different solutions on this carrier, atomic cross chains, that's ILP, bridging payment channels, etc. Um, those are the details of how you would actually do that, and there are different trades of different technologies and, and approaches. And overall, uh, you can say that while you often say that smart contracts are required for interledger operations, technically not always, but they are preferable often because of the flexibility that they offer. The end goal in this scenario is always to make, in some way, make sure that we have on one ledger, we have uh, sort of the, the decentralization trust boundary extends from the end user to the whole blockchain. And similarly, in the IoT domain, from the IoT device to the, this IoT friendly blockchain, whether it's a consortia or private ledger. And then to have a protocol interledger operation that securely crosses these two domains in a way that provides us with an unbroken chain of, of decentralization and trust properties. Overall, the pros and cons, I mentioned some of these and, and Joyce also mentioned some of those. Um, the primary reason for using sort of an IoT chain interlace scanner is that, that you can be used case specific trade offs you can select the technology or parameterize the, the creation parameters of, of the IoT chain in a way that meets the use case requirements better. One other thing is often often when you have a private or consortium ledger, the governance models are much easier to manage. Like and these are important for legal and, and uh, contractual reasons for business actually making business. But there are other reasons why to use uh, sort of a separate IoT chain and, and link it with interledger technologies to maybe a public chain or other chain. It's lower cost, better latency, privacy issue, GDPR is a very important consideration. 
And then another thing is that trust and security concerns are actually often scope. So if I have an IoT solution that provides maybe data or control to say 20 different participants, uh, the security concerns are between me, my solution, and those participants. And, and the general internet or general Ethereum or general Bitcoin users, they don't really care at all, at all about that. And then the use of private uh, or, or intelligent technology allows the businesses to scope that concern. There's bad signs. One of the primary one is that cross-ledger operations and intelligent operations are still very young, but there is not really major standards or widespread solutions to use. Uh, because Sophie, for example, using the inter providing the intelligent gateway is trying to remediate that, but that's still one of the realities that, that is problem with intelligent. So, in general, you can say that intelligent technologies and intelligent approaches are less major than blockchains or DLTs in general. So that's of course a consideration if you want to use it, you need to take into account. And another thing is that trust in decentralized environment is already a bit difficult and when you combine multiple different decentralized environments the ledger with different uh, trust properties that can get really complicated and really problematic and generally you need always need to consider things about how, how, how you do auditability trust and verify process so in summary uh, the reason why we talk about interledger and IoT often is that direct IoT to blockchain integration is often difficult. There's ways to do that, um, but often you end up in a private or permission or consortium blockchain. And if you have any need to block cross that boundary to other other company blockchain, public blockchain, or some other blockchain consortium, that's where you need intelligent operations. And that's where the intelligent techniques can really bridge this trust gap. There's also the other benefits of actually getting things to work. But that's perhaps from the viewpoint of decentralized security and decentralized stuff is the most important. Okay, I have some references here. Uh, some of these overlap with uh, what George provided also earlier. But that's it. I think I'm actually a bit. I have a schedule here. So. So, oh, okay, uh, then I think that I can uh, take over. Uh, I guess we should have a, like a QA part. Ah, okay, uh, okay, it's a question. I'm waiting for our organizers to give us a comment or hint on how to proceed here. Yeah, I stop sharing. So, um, no comments, no questions. So did we have a... So there was a question from uh, Federico M. Facca. Uh, I think it's uh, to George Polizos. Uh, what are your consideration on performance related in blockchain adoption in IoT? So I'm not sure exactly what you mean by the question. So maybe you can, uh, you can repeat it, but... Uh, to some extent, Santeri discussed uh, that uh, there are issues of connecting directly IoT to uh, blockchains, and one of the issues is performance. Uh, and um, so uh, that's why we do it through Interledger in most of the cases or, or through uh, private uh, ledgers. And this will be discussed uh, across the board for in, in all uh, of the presentations, I think, uh, today. I'm not sure if the question had a different meaning. Is there any other question? Maybe live? Maybe, maybe I can could that perhaps elaborate a bit on that. A performance, uh, for uh, essentially a throughput performance question is often a big problem of, of when you're transacting on blockchains. And uh, essentially, if you look at any high volume, high, like uh, maybe passing information from an IoT device to, to other sources, in generally, uh, public blockchains are used only for, can actually be used, so like Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin, maybe some others you get into the issues of cost and also transactional performance and other things and that's one of the reasons why 
if you are talking about high volumes, but actually like in food chain part of time, volume part of time, others, it doesn't really make it possible to transact everything on a public blockchain and you then need to have some other mechanism, which in the ledger approach, it is one that where you have a separate blockchain for the high volume stuff and, and then just consolidate the trust issues across these two ledgers. But there's different use cases for, for that. I don't know whether that's helped answering the question at all. So maybe Federico, you can chat to if you get the answer correct. Uh, answer. Yeah, yeah, I, I can say that it definitely introduces latency, uh, but that's one of the concerns on, on uh, this um, different properties on different ledgers. Of course, if you want to transact on your Bitcoin, for example, as a uh, component in your intellectual operations chain, that does introduce a huge amount of latency, but that is also a business and use case specific trade off. And, and, different intellectual approaches can address those in different ways, but you are often bound by the technological choice, the, the capacities of the ledger to be used. Um, and I, I guess me and George could go on for quite a while about this. No, thank you, Santeri. So uh, if I can add one more thing, we can, if, if, if uh, uh, minimum latency is needed, uh, one other trick we can do is off-chain transactions uh, between uh, two players. And uh, there are various tricks that can be discussed. And, and, and again, uh, Interledger can, uh, can, can also help in some of these cases, uh, have, both the, have the best of both uh, worlds. We can discuss uh, this further, but uh, uh, maybe uh, we should uh, move on to uh, Vasilios' presence. Uh, I think he might actually uh, help with uh, some of these issues. So, Vasilios, please. Okay. Uh, yes. Hello from my side uh, as well. So, you should uh, now see my slides. So my name is Vasilios Siris. I'm with the Athens University of Economics and Business. And I'll give a presentation about uh, the application of uh, decentralized identifiers, DIDs, and verifiable credentials uh, to constrained uh, IoT uh, devices. So starting off, I would like to give some motivation of why constrained IoT devices. And when I uh, refer to constraint, this includes also constraint in terms of network connectivity, meaning that they're either intermittent connected to the internet or even not connected at all. Uh, the specific scenario that we consider is that of the authorization to constraint IoT devices, and I'll talk about this uh, later. I'll continue after the motivation with uh, some key points of what decentralized identifiers are and what verifiable credentials are. And I'll close up putting things together on how and why DIDs and uh, VCs decentralized identifiers, verifiable credentials can uh, be applied to authorization in constrained IoT environments. So starting off, why are constrained IoT environments uh, interesting? The obvious, of course, answer is that there are IoT devices which are constrained in terms of both processing, in terms of storage, but also in terms of network connectivity due to the wireless interface being short range. However, even if devices are not constrained, there are some advantages in reducing the usage. Advantages in terms of reducing the power consumption, but also advantages if a device is not connected continuously to the internet, then the security threats are reduced. Also, uh, by addressing this issue of uh, interconnecting uh, in a secure and trusted manner, IoT devices in a constrained manner, uh, this also helps in the scalability of the IoT system since the interconnection doesn't need to happen all the time, but only when the, uh, it is needed. 
And also there are, uh, exist already mature device to device uh, technologies. And the key question now, I think, is not only how to interconnect devices, but how to achieve this interconnection in a trusted manner. So authorization to IoT uh, resources in constrained devices. The scenario that I assume is that there's an IoT resource that resides on a constrained IoT device that has only short range device to device connectivity. And there's a client that seeks to access uh, this uh, IoT resource. Of course, this would require that the client obtains permission from the resource owner through some request, and as a response, the owner gives an authorization grant. Now, because the IoT device is, is constrained, uh, handling of uh, authorization requests on behalf of this device can be achieved through an entity that is called authorization server. And this is actually work that is being uh, pursued uh, at this time through an IETF uh, working group that investigates the application of uh, the OAuth authorization framework for authorization to constraint IoT devices. Of course, this requires that the authorization server has a secure binding with the IoT resource in order to have uh, the ver verification to handle authorization requests on its behalf. And of, co of course, it also requires the consent through the authorization grant that I mentioned before from the resource owner. After the authorization grant is obtained by the client, it is forwarded to the authorization server, which in turn returns a, an authorization token which is then used as the last step for the client to access the IoT resource. Now let's go to decentralized identifiers. What are decentralized identifiers? They are self-sovereign identifiers for individuals, for organizations, for things. The key properties of decentralized identifiers is that they're under the control not of an organization of an authority that has provided to users these identities, but they are under the control of the user itself. This has very important and significant implications since if an identifier is provided by the organization, then if something happens to the organization, these identifiers can be lost. Whereas if they are controlled by the users themselves, then they can't be lost if some organization uh, ceases to exist, for example. Some key properties that uh, altogether are combined in the uh, work on decentralized identifiers is that they are decentralized, as the name implies. They are persistent. They are not controlled by some single uh, authorization entity. They are resolvable, I'll talk about this later, and they can also be verified in a cryptographic secure manner. They can be registered on a blockchain, not necessarily the blockchains, the public blockchains that you uh, hear. They can be registered in some decentralized uh, network or even off chain. And this addresses the uh, concerns in terms of latency uh, that were uh, identified previously. Uh, DIDs are currently being specified by uh, W3C, and they have a hierarchical format which consists of a scheme, the DID, of a method, we'll see what the method does later, and an identifier that is specific to the method. So there can exist different methods, you see some examples on the screen, which essentially define how uh, four key operations are performed. And the four key operations include how a DID is created, how it is read or resolved, how it is updated, and if needed, how it's deleted or revoked. And uh, going to the read or resolution function, the read or resolution function essentially 
uh, translate uh, the DID to a DID document, which contains things like public keys that allow someone to uh, check and verify whether the DID owner is indeed the owner of a DID, and it has some other uh, data such as uh, service endpoints, end uh, proofs, uh, etc. So let's see an example of how one would apply DIDs. Let's say we have a DID owner and he wants to demonstrate that he is indeed the owner and controls a DID to some party. The party goes and uh, sends this DID to a, a, resol a resolver, which essentially uh, accesses uh, something like a global da database, which uh, contains uh, key value uh, pairs where the key is the DID and the value is the DID document that I mentioned before. And this is what the DID resolver returns to the party. The DID document has information such as the public keys that I mentioned, and this information allows the party to verify that indeed the DID owner is in control of the DID. Now let's move to verifiable credentials. Uh, a credential in general is a set of one or more claims. Uh, this verifiable credentials as DIDs uh, is work and it's actually a completed recommendation of W3C. It requires uh, a framework for, for identities. What you see in the figure, you see a holder, essentially the holder of the verifiable credential receives credentials from the issuer, hence uh, sits in between the issuer and the verifier. It obtains the, the verifiable credentials from the issuer, uh, it stores them, and then it can uh, provide them to verifiers which uh, can, uh, as a next step, verify their validity. Uh, some key points is that the interfacing and the path between the issuer and the holder doesn't need to be direct. It can involve untrusted entities, and this is where a power of verifiable credentials uh, resides. Uh, and also a key issue and advantage of verifiable credentials, similar to DIDs, where uh, the ID, as noted before, is controlled exclusively by the user. This is similar to verifiable credentials. The users, the holders in the picture, are the ones that control which VCs to provide and when to provide them. So this issue of user control exists for both DIDs and verifiable credentials. And as I said, uh, the intermediaries between the issuer and the holder and the holder and the verifier can be uh, intermediate entities, not necessarily trusted. So let's go on now to see how we can apply and what the advantages from the application of DIDs and VCs to the authorization scenario that I quickly uh, highlighted uh, in the beginning. So we have the resource owner, the authorization server, the client and the IoT resource, which again is uh, not connected to the internet, at least not connected continuously, but the client can access the IoT resource through device-to-device -device, uh, communication. So the first application of DIDs is that they can be applied, used to identify an IoT resource and through that to bind the resource owner to the IoT resource that the owner owns. And this can also allow through information in the DID document, which is provided after the resolution uh, function uh, to have information on how the uh, resource owner can be authenticated. Next, uh, DIDs can be applied to both clients and to the authorization server in order to authenticate one to the other. Next, uh, Recall that I mentioned that uh, for a client to access an IoT resource, 
he needs the permission of the resource owner. However, with the IDs, providing the IDs in authorization lists that uh, exist in the authorization server allows the resource owner to be offline. And the only requirement is that he has provided the information on who, which the IDs that is, can access the resource he owns. Finally, and this is very important, uh, we need not use the same DIDs for all interactions. On the contrary, we can use multiple, a very large number of DIDs, indeed pairwise unique DIDs for all interconnection between the client and the authorization server and be the, between the client and the IoT resource. Hence, in some way, DIDs are pseudonyms that can be used. And because uh, a client in particular can use multiple DIDs that can improve his privacy. Now, how about verifiable credentials? Now, recall that verifiable credentials have three key entities. The issuer of the verifiable credential, the holder, and then the verifier. In the figure, I map these three entities to the entities in the authorization scenario that I mentioned in the beginning. So uh, recall that the owner needs to provide, uh, uh, to grant access uh, to the IoT resource for the client. This can be through the form of a, a verifiable credential that the resource owner as an issuer provides the, the holder which then forwards the verifiable credential to the authorization server, which acts as a verifier in order to obtain the client, in order to obtain the IoT token that can be used to access the resource. And also recall that a key advantage here for the client is that the client can disclose only the necessary information or the necessary verifiable credentials in order to uh, demonstrate that the uh, owner of the resource indeed authorizes the client to access it. Next, we can essentially uh, uh, change the role of the client and the authorization server. Uh, and now it is the client that is the verifier and the authorization server that is the holder. Recall in the beginning that I mentioned about uh, a bounding, a security binding between the authorization server and the IoT resource. This binding needs to be uh, demonstrated uh, and verified by the issuer. And he can do this through a verifiable credential, which the resource owner, which is the issuer as he was before, provides to the authorization server which essentially verifies that the authorization server is indeed entitled to act as a proxy for authorization requests to the IoT resource. Hence, when a client needs to obtain access, he can ensure uh, his, himself that indeed the authorization server he's talking with uh, is verified to provide access to the particular IoT uh, resource. And also another key advantage uh, of this model is that at any point in time using uh, capabilities that are provided by the verifiable credentials, the issuer, the resource owner, can change the authorization server that should handle authorization requests on behalf of the IoT resource he or she owns. So these are key properties and advantages in utilizing uh, VCs for, um, uh, for the authorization to constrain IoT resources that uh, I presented in the beginning. So what are the key takeaways? Uh, constrained IoT devices exist because constrained IoT devices exist, but they're interesting also in reducing the resource usage in order to save power, in order to provide increased security, and in order to uh, achieve scalability. 
uh, authorization to constrain IoT devices. I mentioned the uh, IETF OAuth uh, authorization framework. In my presentation, I mentioned only uh, constrained IoT resources. However, the models that I present can be equally applied to the case where the clients are constrained. And there, for example, we can have interesting scenarios where the client is not a smartphone, which is always connected, but it can be a wristband or some other device with only short range communication capabilities. DIDs. DIDs are, are self-sovereign identifiers, which are controlled by the users, which have simultaneously four key properties. They are decentralized, they are persistent, they don't depend on the existence of an organization that handles, that is the ID identifier provider, they are resolvable, and they are cryptographically verifiable. And in contrast, because one of the questions that you might ask, well, doesn't that, uh, uh, can't that be achieved through PKI? PKI is a centralized, hierarchical, meant, but centralized trust framework. Verifiable credentials are essentially claims that can be verified through cryptographic mechanisms that are provided by the issuer to the holder in order to be verified by the verifier. And finally, putting it all together, uh, DIDs and VCs combined can provide things such as binding, cryptographically binding the IoT resource to the resource owners, authenticating the authorization servers and the clients, utilizing multiple pairwise unique DIDs can improve privacy, and they can also be used uh, VCs in particular for authorization grants and for identifying and verifying that an authorization server indeed is authorized to handle uh, requests on behalf of an IoT resource. And all the above can be done in a decentralized manner where users are in control of their identities, their credentials, and the information that they disclose uh, to the various entities. So, Thank you, that concludes my talk and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. There are a number of questions, Vasilios. I don't know if you can look at the chat or the Q and A, uh, but uh, I can read some of those to you if you want. Uh, one yes, is one I'll start is... reading also myself. <laughs> okay, so then you see them, right? Uh relation of DID and interoperability with URNs? Uh, well, actually DID is the format, as I showed, uh, follows the format of URNs. So the, the first identifier essentially identifies that uh, our particular URN is indeed a DID. Uh, so there's compatibility and this is to be expected since uh, W3C uh, is behind uh, both the IDs and VCs as it is uh, produced the, the URN format. Uh, Let's move to the next question. So uh, the question is about verifiable credential credentials that can be provided directly uh, to the IoT uh, resources without uh, authorization servers. Uh, would you like to discuss this? Uh, of course, uh, when an, uh, this can be possible, for example, if uh, the resource owner provides it. Uh, so the answer is yes. Uh, and as I mentioned, the, the VC, Verifiable Convention Framework, does not uh, necessarily impose uh, which the intermediaries between the issuer and the holder of a VC uh, is. Uh, so the answer is yes, there are multiple different combinations. So for example, I can have a, a client device which is continuously connected. Uh, this device can actually be the, the owner and the owner provides the VC directly to my uh, wristband or smartwatch which has a, a short range only connectivity. But in general, there are various trade-offs as, as you have discussed, Vasilios, but uh, more generally, 
and uh, in many cases uh, we want we don't want too much functionality on the devices on the iot devices themselves for for various reasons because they might be constrained but also they might be uh, uh, fragile in the sense that they can be uh, out there they can be captured and we might not want to have um, uh, security parameters on them so uh, there are various trade-offs in, in various applications that's true and just to add to this for example uh, if uh, uh, one thinks that an iot device has a possibility to be compromised he can use verifiable credentials which have a a short uh, time span, uh, which will be invalidated after some time. And this essentially protects uh, someone from, uh, you know, having his IoT resource compromised. I see more questions. Uh, I see one, how would you differentiate between resource owner and data owner on one constrained device with DID? Well, uh, the owner of something uh, it is clear in the real world. He has uh, possession of this. Uh, what is interesting, if we go to the realm of DIDs, then the owner might not be the person or the entity that controls the DID. So that's where one needs to differentiate between, for example, the owner and the controller of a DID. But of course, there's no single mapping. In the real world, there are different relations. Uh, one can define uh, more or less what the owner uh, of some data is. I think that with GDPR and all these issues related to privacy and control of one's data, it is the mechanisms that are important that would allow the owner to actually control his data. And in this direction, DIDs and VCs utilizing uh, frameworks such as OAuth uh, provide mechanisms in order to allow users to control uh, the data or any IoT resource, resource in general, that they own. Vasilius, just a quick answer if possible to the following question. What should be created first, DIDs or DID documents or verifiable credentials? or doesn't the order matter? Well, a DID is related to a DID document. So the creation of a DID necessitates that there's a corresponding DID document which has information on how the DID owner should be verified. So this is a first step. Uh, and verifiable credentials actually sit on top of DIDs. They don't require necessarily DIDs. They can use uh, centralized, let's say, uh, or uh, of, uh, other uh, types of DIDs, but they do require uh, some identifiers in order to identify who the issuer is, who the holder, the user, uh, in order for the verifier to be able to verify the verifiable credential. Okay, thank you very much, Vasilios. I think we need to move on. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Brit. Anton, uh, who is a program manager and business analyst for uh, Gartime. Uh, Prit, can you take over? Yes, I can. Thank Wait. you, George. Good day, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you here today in the Sophie and Cyber Watching Workshop. And it's a good thing that we have already dig deep into the technical discussion. So within next 10 minutes, I will give you a practical example on how we contribute to the future energy services and its security and privacy. So my name is Preet Danton and I work in Gartime. Gartime is a world's leading blockchain technology with actual production deployments in governments and Fortune 500 companies to tackle the fundamental challenges in cybersecurity. Today we have eight offices and 200 people around the globe and are focusing on data-centric cybersecurity solutions in defense, telecom, government, and of course in energy sector. And my job in guard time is to understand what the problems and challenges of the customers are and find 
solutions to them. So why we are in energy sector? Because the energy sector is changing really fast. Everybody needs greener energy, sustainable energy, cheaper and uh, more flexible services and at the same time uh, have its privacy preserved and uh, be protected against cyber threats. So these are all the problems that the energy sector participants need to solve. So this can be uh, highlighted into three main categories. The regulatory drivers to comply with EU clean energy package and the GDPR is something that everyone who wants to operate in this, uh, this sector has to, has to think about. And it's not only like complying, but you have to build these systems and uh, provide everything that is needed to, to the end user as well as the service providers. Then there is the financial drivers that is a basically a race to offer new services to the market and to deal with the data access, uh, to deal with uh, security solutions and uh, user uptake. And uh, this is not an easy task. And third part is of course the end user expectation to be in control of his or her data. So we have a questionnaire today here as well uh, submitted to you. Please try to answer that uh, uh, while uh, I present here. It is a very valuable information to us. So going from these major challenges into the specific problems that we are solving. So what we are doing is we will enable the data access uh, from the household level to the data hub level. We will deliver an auditability and privacy solution to all the participants in the network and we provide integrity of energy consumption data and transparency mechanisms to both the uh, data owner side to service providers as well as the uh, data operator side. So what is the solution that we are using to do that? Here is an example of the Sophie practical approach and we have here down in a uh, slide the existing data input side from the household level up to the national uh, data hubs and in between the regional data hubs and uh, and also uh, energy production uh, information as well and in the upper corner we have all these service providers that require access to this data. And of course, these systems are already in place, but the challenge that they have is that, that it's not just letting somebody get access to a database. You have to comply with all the rules and regulations as well as, as provide this uh, functionality for security and audit. So that if there is a data breach, for example, then you have a way of dealing that and uh, be able to provide either proof that you did nothing wrong or at least have a possibility to trace down uh, where something went wrong. So in the middle, we have uh, the Sophie Energy Grid adapters uh, that deliver this technology uh, that was already explained quite uh, uh, well from uh, Vasilia's slides of uh, uh, decentralized identifiers, verifiable credentials, car times, KSI, blockchain technology, to build a bridge between the data sources and the service providers that need an access to that. And not only build the bridge, but actually do at least two things more. One is to grant the access control of who gets the data to the data owner side. So you simply will have a mobile phone in your hand and you can choose who gets the access and uh, who has already received the information and have some proof together with that. And the proof itself comes also 
very handy from the third party uh, auditor side as well as the national data hubs that have to take the risk to let in maybe hundreds of different service providers that, that uh, provide the services to, uh, to you. And I think one important point to make is that uh, uh, actual uh, requirement from the uh, network operator side is that filling these requirements with less uh, work and cost as possible because this is something that, that you may have to do because of the regulations that are currently at hand and because of their user expectations. So uh, the less they spend for that, the, the happier they are. And this is where the Sophie Energy Grid adapters uh, come in to do some work for them and uh, be able to uh, let the network operator service providers uh, to uh, do their business as usual. So what does it look from the user's perspective? When you are opting to a Sophie adapter, the first thing that you will see, the consumer will get an overview of his or her energy consumption and production data. You may this, have this already when you are connected to the one data hub, but uh, think when you have not one connected part, but maybe like two households or uh, or you have a solar panel production facility also needed to show the energy production information for you. So it is a multiple points that you get the data from and not all are from the one place. So this overview of the energy production is the first thing that you get. And from there where you select uh, the best service provider to buy the energy from you or uh, offer you a contract for, for a, a cheaper price uh, for your energy consumption, you will be able to grant access directly from your uh, mobile phone to these participants. And this is done using the Sophie Federated approach and using the Sophie uh, adapters uh, in the process. So, of course, you can also see the history of when uh, was the access granted and uh, revoke the access that, that is no more necessary, for example, if you cancel the, the contract, for example. And finally, uh, as was also mentioned before, that, that it's not only the, the data exchange and accessibility part, but it's the, the proofs that are created during this whole process with uh, interaction to very many different uh, parties. So uh, having a dashboard for uh, the household level to, to see uh, who accessed your data, but even more importantly, to have some kind of a way of showing if you are a data hub operator that uh, you did everything right when uh, there is a data leak and uh, you have to prove that there is no uh, problems uh, that that you could have solved and that you did everything by the book. So we are not talking only about uh, one uh, country and the approach on the national data hub level, but the actual value comes when you have uh, different data hubs sharing the data uh, to the service providers. And uh, this is the, the main uh, thing to, to offer when, when you are using these uh, Sophie Federated adapters uh, in each of the data node that is connected to that. But not to forget that the access control itself will be on the data owners level still, not on, on each of the data hubs that, that uh, connect to this. And uh, in the meantime, this means that we have interday energy brokers, retailers and network operators all uh, able to offer their services and include you in the in the business with with the control from from your hand. And uh, if you talk about numbers, then, for example, joining uh, this 500 million 
smart meters in Europe, even like this number is growing daily uh, together so that you have a possibility to access them uh, and uh, offer services is, is what we are doing in, uh, in SOFI project. So in conclusion, uh, we have to uh, carefully think that, that uh, the data that uh, is currently in, in some way accessible is really crucial for the future services and we have to have a ways to uh, solve this. And, and I think the, the technology that we are using right now is, is a way of uh, doing it. Uh, then the decentralization versus the centralized approach. If you take the energy sector, then you have uh, energy uh, networks in cross-border and uh, the services offered uh, and also the energy produced cross-border and uh, it's not uh, reasonable to have uh, these sectioned in each of the country, but actually have a way of uh, buying the energy or selling the energy to, uh, to your neighbor that is in the other country. And it's really an obstacle right now if you are uh, connected to one data hub and, and can't do that right now. And thirdly, of course, the security and privacy aspects have to take in, into consideration in the beginning. So when you are building the systems right now, then uh, think about this how to solve them uh, right now, not uh, when they are built and then you have to kind of, uh, deal with the consequences. So from the uh, SOFI project perspective, we are in the end line of the project. So uh, we, the project will end in 2020 and we will have the authentication and decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials working with the data owner having the control. And then we invite everybody to contact us to see how you could be onboarded here. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, Preet. And uh, we need to pass directly to uh, Giuseppe, Giuseppe Venduto, who is an engineer and computer scientist uh, working as a researcher in uh, engineering's R&D uh, lab. Giuseppe, can you take over? Yes. Brit, you need to stop sharing. Great, thanks. So, Giuseppe will describe a marketplace for energy flexibility. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Okay, so. Yes, I'm Giuseppe Raveduto and I work as a researcher in engineering, engineering informatica in the research and development laboratory. And I will present our work in the energy flexibility marketplace pilot of SOFI. So our pilot investigates how the fleet managers and the distribution system operators can cooperate uh, using a marketplace uh, and balance the production from uh, renewable energy sources with the consumption of a fleet of electric uh, vehicles. Uh, distribution system operator is the, uh, responsible for uh, operating and uh, maintaining uh, the electric distribution system in a given area and uh, also its uh, interconnections uh, with, the, with the other systems. A fleet manager, on the other hand, uh, is in charge of uh, scheduling, uh, routing, and maintaining a fleet of uh, transport vehicles. Uh, the main issue that we want to solve uh, is the, that the excess of uh, production from uh, renewable energy sources uh, being uncontrolled may cause uh, imbalances uh, on, the, on the network. So in our scenario, the DSO can uh, collaborate uh, with the electric vehicles uh, fleet managers uh, to handle uh, energy losses, uh, voltage deviation, uh, overloads, and uh, reverse power flows. So basically, uh, they are uh, trying to stabilize the, the, the grid. Uh, the electric vehicles are, are considered the 
flexibility resources uh, being able to provide uh, services uh, like uh, consumption or production peak sharing uh, or, or, or load shifts so uh, that are useful to avoid uh, congestions on the on the network the enabling uh, technologies are the iot platforms uh, that allow the uh, business handling so for example the electric vehicle vehicles uh, monitoring systems and the uh, advanced uh, smart meters uh, for of the dso and the blockchain technology that is uh, uh, used for uh, manage the local flexibility marketplace. The platform was designed uh, uh, considering the needs of our uh, stakeholders. So uh, the DSO, the distribution system operators, are facing uh, an increase in the distributed uh, renewable energy sources and electric vehicle supply equipment uh, penetration. Uh, so they need to increase their, their hosting capacity. The flexibility marketplace uh, helps reducing the cost on infrastructure, shaving the consumption or production peaks. Uh, the additional benefits for the DSO are the uh, exploitation of um, the exploration of new business model and also the uh, improving uh, and improved uh, power uh, quality. On the other hand, the, uh, the fleet managers uh, can reduce the operational cost. Uh, thanks to the, uh, the energy retail marketplace uh, and also the, the incentives uh, awarded by participating in uh, flexibility markets may cover parts of the electric supply. The main actors that we identified are the already mentioned uh, DSO and the fleet managers and the energy retailers. To support our scenario, uh, we designed a platform that integrates the SOFI components with the pre-existing uh, pilot infrastructure, as is shown uh, here. Um, without going in detail uh, for each specific uh, component that are anyway all publicly released and documented, I want to focus on the decentralized marketplace uh, and the uh, interledger component that are the uh, main, uh, the core uh, functionalities for our uh, uh, market, decentralized marketplace and on the uh, uh, federation adapters that are enabling the, the usage of uh, the existing IoT platform. And the, the marketplace, um, uh, Uses, uses an Ethereum-based uh, smart contracts to store the flexibility requests from the DSO and the offers uh, received from the fleet managers. So uh, this ensures also transparency and auditability because the matchmaking uh, logic is embedded in the source code of the, of the, of the smart contract. Let's see how, let's see how uh, we implemented uh, this. Uh, the DSO operator can uh, interact with uh, the dedicated uh, dashboard, can interact with the platform, and uh, you can see how the dashboard presents the uh, real-time power data from the IoT smart meters, and also a power forecast uh, based on uh, historical data. Uh, so, uh, based on this data, the operator can create uh, market requests uh, directly from here using the form that is uh, visible in the bottom half of the, of the page. And the dashboard presents also the list with all the past and active marketplace requests. And each, uh, each item on the list uh, presents the uh, offers received uh, from the fleet managers uh, and the, uh, the request uh, details. Uh, in fact, for, uh, for each request, we need to specify a time window, a charging station that uh, must be present in the, in the zone that we need to, to balance, and the quantity of energy uh, request. Uh, and uh, also the quantity of uh, tokens that we are offering uh, to the fleet manager that will uh, fulfill this, uh, this request. 
So that was the request phase. Uh, now let's see how the fleet manager uh, can uh, operator can interact with the with the platform. So using its own dashboard, uh, from here the operator can uh, react to the to the marketplace request and can submit the new flexibility offers. Uh, and consult the list of uh, active campaigns on the marketplace and monitor its, uh, its, the status of its uh, fleet and the charging stations. And using the same dashboard, uh, the, the fleet manager can also uh, create new uh, requests uh, uh, in the marketplace, requests for the energy supply that uh, will ensure uh, the power supply that he will need to fulfill the DSO uh, request uh, cheaply. Thanks to the integration with the IoT platforms, uh, the fleet manager can also check uh, real-time information on the vehicles and the charging station. So uh, as an example, in this case, we are see the details on, uh, of an ongoing uh, request. The process ends with the delivery phase. In this phase, uh, after the vehicle is charged, the, the token payment is uh, unlocked. And as can be seen here, the tokens can be managed using any Ethereum standard uh, wallet. What are the results? The first evaluation shows that the charging station, charging session um, uh, rescheduling uh, can increase the self uh, consumption uh, without interfering with the activities of the of the fleet. The simulation um, results show that the potential contribution from the electric vehicle supply equipment. Uh, on balancing the, the production with 50% uh, of charging session that could be uh, uh, rescheduled uh, potentially for balancing the excess of uh, production, so the production peaks of the, of the district. In, um, in this way, it's possible to, to decrease the, uh, the energy that is taken from the, from the grid for the charging session uh, needs and also increase uh, the uh, self-sufficiency for the electric vehicles. The self-sufficiency of the electric vehicles is the share of solar production uh, drawn by the electric car charging stations. On the other hand, thanks to the usage of renewable uh, by the electric vehicles, we can see how the prosumer can also increase the, the money saved. So uh, considering uh, the, an average uh, retail price uh, of 0 0.26 euro per kilowatt hour, and uh, also the average price uh, for the energy that is sold back to, uh, by, by the consumers to the retailers, that is 0, 0 0.13 euro per kilowatt hour, the self-consumption allows the consumers to save 0 0.13 euro per kilowatt hour produced. And considering this, uh, we can also see how this uh, contributes uh, to reduce the CO2 emissions. Uh, in fact, uh, each kilowatt hours of energy that is taken from the grid is associated with a quantity of CO2 of almost 500 grams due to, due to its uh, production. In summary, uh, the platform offer, uh, offers different uh, benefits for the actors involved. The DSO, for example, can forecast the occurrence of possible uh, uh, grid issues. And thanks to the uh, advanced uh, metering uh, devices, uh, can balance the local energy supply accordingly, creating uh, flexibility requests on the decentralized marketplace. Uh, the fleet managers can also uh, reduce the management cost of the, of the fleet. Uh, thanks to the, to the marketplace, it's possible to select the most convenient uh, retailer at any time. Uh, and uh, also the incentives awarded by the DSO for the flexibility provision help to cover parts of its uh, electric supply costs. Um, finally, all the users uh, involved will benefit from uh, a rapid user-friendly mechanism to negotiate uh, a microcontract on the fly. The security 
a transparency and the auditability of the operation that is granted by the, the blockchain. And thanks to the federation uh, approach, the different uh, siloed IoT system can uh, interoperate. And this is true also for, uh, for new actors, for example, new, new fleet managers that will, uh, will join the, the marketplace. Okay, that was uh, the last Thank slide you, for me. We're a little bit uh, behind time, so I think, and I do not see any questions right now, unless something is wrong with my window. Uh, let's uh, go directly uh, to the next presentation by uh, Max uh, Samarin, who is a, a game design and development professional with uh, Rovio Entertainment and we'll have uh, questions uh, uh, at the end. So Max, please uh, take over. Thank you, we see your slides. But we cannot hear you, Max. There we go. Now you can hear me. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Hey, everybody. My name is Max Samarin. Uh, I'm from Rovio Entertainment, a Finnish mobile gaming company behind games such as Angry Birds. And uh, yeah, uh, we are in the we are one of the pilot companies in the Sophie project, and we, we use this project as an opportunity to learn, research, and explore what kinds of uh, opportunities um, blockchain and in internet of things technologies bring to mobile gaming if if any so we we can imagine a hypothetical scenario of iot gaming where iot devices could be used for location-based gaming so for example bluetooth beacons uh, if you're near one of those it, it can uh, localize you so uh, in such an ecosystem there could be many parties involved. There are the players who, who are playing the location-based games. We have the game developers who develop various um, location-based games that use the same um, IoT infrastructure. We also have the owners of the IoT devices and we also have the uh, real points of interest, so real-world locations into which uh, the players come and um, do the challenges. So uh, it, it makes it since there are so many parties involved, uh, it makes it worthwhile to at least research if um, if uh, a if, if such an ecosystem could be built on a decentralized ledger. So, I also have a few other concrete uh, potential use cases. So, for example, if if cryptocurrencies would become a mainstream method of payment, that's something that um, games could support in uh, in our purchases. And also, if the rewards that players receive inside games, um, if they are stored on the blockchain, uh, the players may then receive a sense of true ownership if they can sell and trade uh, those items as they wish. And also, if the virtual items are stored out, out, basically outside of the game server on, uh, on a blockchain, it's also theoretically possible that multiple games uh, share the same virtual assets. Of course, that brings different uh, game design challenges, but it's theoretically and, and uh, technologically possible. And also, let's say that if uh, if one of the games gets killed uh, because of the rewards that the player has received so far uh, is stored outside of the game on a blockchain, uh, they could ba basically um, uh, preserve the value and their progress of the game in, in one form or another. Uh, as for the Internet of Things, uh, we can think about location-based games. So, for example, GPS is not that accurate anymore if you want to localize users inside buildings or underground. Uh, so, if you want to know, for example, which floor of the building the user is located on, uh, GPS is not that good for that anymore. So, you can use, for example, Bluetooth beacons that broadcast signals and the mobile device catches those and the game can figure out um, which room uh, inside a building the user is located on. 
And also in the case of competitive location-based games, uh, GPS can be easily spoofed, so players can cheat uh, and say that they are in real-world locations we are not, where they are not really located. Uh, but uh, with Bluetooth beacons and uh, with protocols such as, for example, the Eddystone's EID, uh, we can be more certain and actually verify the player's actual location. So uh, in order to test and explore these use cases, we started by creating a very minimalistic um, a, a prototype of uh, a scavenger hunt game. So inside the game, the player receives a clue uh, in the form of a riddle. And once they solve the riddle, they know where to go next. And that is some physical real world location. And once they are in the location, they receive a task in the form of a question. And based on their uh, physical surroundings, the players can answer the question. And then, then they receive the clue to the next location and so on. And at the end of the hunt, they receive a reward. So you can imagine that such a hunt could uh, visit real world locations such as museums or even cafes. And let's say that a cafe designs a, a, a hunt like this and the last location uh, is at, a, is at uh, one of those cafes. So they can actually give players some rewards uh, that are related to that place. So for example, some discount vouchers that can be stored on the blockchain. So that, that, that's a way that um, physical businesses could actually even get uh, more visitors due to these games and uh, they could give something in return. Uh, and also I mentioned before that it's possible to share multiple, uh, uh, to share virtual items between multiple applications. So we actually tested that a bit as well. So uh, on the leftmost screenshot, we made a very simple uh, application called Blockmoji in which you manage your virtual avatar. So inside the scavenger hunt game, the middle two screenshots, a player plays the hunt and in the, in the end they receive a reward. And then in the last screenshot, we can see that the player actually equips that item and, and, uh, and they can see it. Uh, in, in this specific case, uh, if, if they equip some items, they do not bring any in-game benefits, but, but it's possible that uh, some game decides to interpret the DNA of certain items in any way they want to, to bring in-game benefits. Um, so how do we actually achieve this? We uh, basically by iterating, we, we uh, ended up trying out a hybrid architecture of both a uh, game server and a managed blockchain. So we think it's very important not to use blockchain just for the sake of it, but actually to really think if it brings any benefits and if yes, then use only those functions from the blockchain that actually uh, make sense and use a game server for everything else to, uh, uh, to maintain that great performance. So for example, in this case, we use the blockchain functions when the player basically uh, creates an account, I think, and, and uh, also when they, when they complete a hunt and, and receive items and everything else is on the uh, AWS game server. And also here we can see on the right part of the picture uh, a link to a, a, a public uh, blockchain, which in this example could be an Ethereum. And that's where a Sophie Interledger would come into place. Uh, so we are, we're, we're thinking about using two blockchains in, in this experiment uh, to test that the managed blockchain is used for its uh, speed and to inter interoperability between multiple applications and for trading. Uh, between players where, where transparency is more needed, that's where the public block, blockchain would come into use. And you can, you can also see an arrow going from the managed blockchain to other potential applications that want to use the same virtual items. Uh, so uh, I already mentioned the interledger. It's one of the components that uh, brings benefit to our pilot. And we also have several others, uh, several other software components that we think are useful in our experimentation. So for example, the marketplace uh, would enable uh, players to place offers on the uh, public blockchain and uh, a discovery and provisioning component would, would enable us to um, discover the IoT devices that already exist in the world uh, and add them to the uh, game database uh, if, if they are suitable to be used in, in location-based games. And for that also, uh, the semantic representation component, it means that every IoT device uh, would have a small file, you know, usually in the form of a JSON or similar, 
uh, that describes the device's uh, capabilities and the discovery and provisioning component uh, looks at those at those capabilities and and uh, if it deems that okay this device can be used in some of the games then it can add it to the uh, game backend so yeah this is how we're using uh, Sophie as a great opportunity for us to explore and learn um, what what kinds of use cases are possible from blockchain and IoT for for gaming and if you, if you have any ideas or or uh, anything else you can shoot me an email uh, I have it right there and of course uh, I think I believe we have a short Q&A session uh, after the next presentation so I'll be happy to answer anything so thank you everybody thank you very much Max and we'll move directly to the last main presentation today by uh, Spiros Bulgaris who is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at the uh, Athens University of Economics and Business. Spiros, please take over. Right. Hello, everybody. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, yes. Second. Okay. So, um, yeah, hope you, you can hear me well. So basically, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk uh, one second. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to talk uh, about uh, uh, my our work on blockchain-based architectures for supply for food supply chain management. That's work done, of course, in the SOPI project. Uh, between uh, our university, I'm from the Athens University of Economics and Business, and one of our industrial partners, Synalysis. Uh, so, yeah, uh, this work basically refers to one of the pilots uh, that was mentioned already for this project, uh, the food supply chain management. In this pilot, we consider uh, a food supply chain consisting of five stages. Namely, we have a farm, that's where produce is is uh, uh, generated. We have a transport entity which transfers the, uh, the produce from the farm all the way to the to some uh, storage depot. Uh, then we have a, a, another transport entity which takes produce from the depot all the way to the supermarket, which is the final stage, and uh, produce is finally sold to the end customer. So for that, we consider a number of operations, a number of actions, handover actions, as we call them. Uh, we assume that all produce is being packed and uh, transport, transported end-to-end -end in uh, boxes, which are equipped with RFID tags. And uh, as you can imagine, each, uh, each entity in the whole supply chain is equipped with RFID readers. Therefore, at any given moment, uh, the entity owning uh, ca currently carrying that box can figure out where exactly the box is. So the box is initially handed out to a farmer. Uh, then the farmer will fill it in uh, and call the transport company. He's going to hand it over to the transport employee who's going to take it to the depot. He's going to hand it over to the depot employee and so on and so forth to the second transport entity. And eventually it's going to reach the supermarket. And after the produce has been sold to the customer, uh, the box exits the supply chain, as we say. It is, it is in a way recycled. It's, in other words, ready to enter the supply chain anew. So we have now a number of actions. These are all, all referred to as handover uh, actions, uh, including the box entry, uh, the box uh, um, the pointer, the box entry, having the four handovers between those five stages, and finally the box exit. All this data is recorded uh, for later use as we're going to see, but in, uh, in addition to this data, we also record sensor data. Sensor data, uh, interruptions. okay, sensor data basically, uh, each uh, stage has a number of sensors. For example, the farm records the kind of pesticides being applied, being used, fertilizers, weather conditions, etc. Uh, the transport company has a GPS uh, sensors uh, and uh, humidity and temperature sensors in each truck. 
uh, and so on and so forth. So all of this information is being recorded as well. The whole point of recording all this information is that should a package like a box with the produce arrive at the supermarket in, um, in, in a bad condition, we should be able to perform an audit and figure out safely who is to blame, where exactly the problem occurred. And in order to do that, we have to resort to blockchain technology to, uh, to benefit from its immutability guarantees uh, to make sure we have all data recorded safely there. So we're gonna consider four different uh, configurations for sen architecture scenarios using blockchains. The first one is the simplest and, and most straightforward scenario. It utilizes a public ledger, a single ledger, to store all information. So all handover data for each individual box is being stored on this public ledger, uh, as well as all sensor data, which is being periodically uploaded, periodically stored on this public ledger. As I mentioned, that's simple. Uh, this uh, technique, this architecture has uh, the highest availability because as you can imagine, all data is available by, to all um, participants in this ledger. However, as you would imagine, it's extremely expensive. We all know that public storage, storage on public ledgers is an extremely scarce resource. Therefore, it's very expensive. In order to alleviate that and to prevent having such a, an expensive solution, we came up with a second architecture in which we simply replace this public ledger by a shared ledger. That's a ledger which we run uh, by uh, ourselves is a private ledger run and operated by the, the whole consortium uh, of the supply chain. Now, this makes the cost extremely lower. It's, it's only the operational cost of running the servers that operate, that run this blockchain, this private blockchain. However, we're missing out on, uh, um, on, on immutability uh, because you know any powerful player or even the whole consortium together could rewrite history. They could rewrite the last few blocks to try to hide some data if they wish. In order to, uh, to prevent that, we add a public ledger to this architecture as well. So uh, the idea is, and then we resort to, to this uh, operation known as, known as anchoring. So what we do is that we periodically store the current blocks of the shared ledger, the current blocks cash in a smart contract on the public ledger. Therefore, we guarantee immutability. Uh, the, the consortium or any powerful player of the consortium could, of course, still rewrite history, but it's not going to go unnoticed because the new history, uh, the tampered with history, uh, is is gonna uh, is gonna have blocks, is gonna produce blocks that, that have different uh, hashes compared to the ones stored on this public ledger. Therefore, this technique is much cheaper compared to the first one, and it still uh, guarantees immutability. Now, we're going to proceed to the third option, to the, our third architecture, in which we have split this shared, this single shared ledger into a number of pair ledgers. In this case, four pair ledgers, each one operated by uh, the two adjacent stages, the one before and after this uh, ledger. So uh, this increases privacy uh, since only two adjacent stages have access to a given blockchain, to a given uh, pair ledger. Uh, and uh, in order to guarantee immutability, we still have to resort to this anchoring. So in this case, anchoring is a bit more expensive because in the previous case, in, in uh, scenario number two, we had just a single shared ledger for the whole chain to be periodically anchoring the block hashes into this public ledger. Here we have, in this case, four separate uh, ledgers. Each one has to anchor. So it has four times the cost of the previous one, this periodic cost. But okay, it's not, it's, uh, it's still negligible as we're gonna see. And finally, we move on to our fourth and final architecture scenario in which we entirely drop the idea of using blockchains for uh, private storage, for, for, for storing sensor and handover data. Uh, instead, we allow each player, each stage, uh, to use their private storage, their proprietary formats, whatever, 
However, uh, and also handover data is basically uh, just uh, signed re uh, receipts of uh, the transactions that are, that are signed by both parties participating in, in this handover. However, in order to be able to still perform an audit, we demand that each stage still uh, resorts to anchoring. So whatever format they use, they have to produce some predefined type of format of hash, and they should be periodically storing this hash value into this public ledger. So should an audit uh, uh, be performed, uh, each stage asks about the fate, about the, the history of a given box, uh, they should provide their proprietary, proprietary data regarding the box, that box, and they should also provide their respective hashes stored already in the past in the public, le public ledger to prove that this data is the original one and it has not been tampered with. So uh, we have performed, we have implemented those uh, the respective smart contracts in Ethereum, and we have uh, performed some cost analysis. Uh, now for, for those scenarios, we have in this case, in this graph, we have the cumulative gas, a gas cost per, per box. Like we have for scenario one, uh, the, the gas cost you know, for, for the box entry, then the additional uh, cost for the first handover, the second, fourth, the third, fourth, and finally the box exit. That's cumulative. cumulative. So we have the full cost is um, close to 350,000 gas units in Ethereum. It's all Ethereum. Uh, the second scenario has the same gas costs, but in this case, those this gas uh, cost is applied on the on, on the on the private ledger, on the private shared ledger of this uh, scenario. Uh, the third scenario is the one that has where we have split this shared ledger into separate shared ledgers, pair ledgers. So here we see this color coding showing that which gas cost is applied on on each of those four in our case pair ledgers and the cumulative, cumulative cost, while for scenario four, that's not applicable since we have no ledgers to store sensor and handover data. We also have, oh, yeah, this uh, lower left graph. We also show the, the cost of periodic um, operations for each scenario. So the first scenario, uh, using directly this, the, the public ledger, has to be, to be periodically storing sensor information, information on this public ledger. While the other scenarios, uh, they, don't, they don't store any sensor information on the public ledger. Uh, they, they do it on their private storages or the private ledgers. However, they do have to resort to periodic anchoring, uh, storing block hashes on this, shared on this public ledger. And this is the cost, uh, respectively, for scenarios two, three, and four. What is important to, re to remember, to know, is that, as you see on the top right graph, uh, the gas cost uh, for each of the second, third, and fourth scenarios for a full day's operation is uh, constant. Uh, it's in the order of uh, about 100 euros if we convert everything to, to euros. Uh, it's about 100 euros for a whole day's operation if we assume that we anchor, uh, we use anchoring every once every five minutes and we store sensor data also once every five minutes. However, for scenario one, where we store also box handovers on this public ledger, the total cost is a function, is a function of the number of boxes that we uh, process on a single day. And finally, if we uh, produce uh, for a typical load of 6,000 boxes a day, if we produce the entire cost, we have on the left side of the table, we have the cost for transferring those, for processing those 6,000 boxes, which is exorbitant for scenario one. It's about 4,000 euros a day. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have the periodic costs for anchoring or for sensor logging, which is, as I mentioned, in the order like it's somewhere between 28 and 143 euros, which the same order of magnitude. And we have the total cost, which is, you can see scenario one is way more expensive compared to the rest. Okay, now something which is important to mention, uh, let me get back. Uh, it's important to take a look at on the top left graph to see that the total cost uh, for scenarios one and two is applied on a single 
ledger, like you know, on the public ledger in the case of scenario one, on the single shared ledger in case of scenario two. In scenario three, the, the aggregate cost is slightly higher for whatever reasons of the smart contract details. However, this cost is distributed across four separate distinct uh, private ledgers. Now, given the fact that in Ethereum, the cost, the total gas cost uh, that you have to, that, that, that each transaction costs, that takes, uh, is a, a metric of the bottling, or is a metric of, of how many transactions you can fit in a single box. So there is a threshold of how, many, how much gas you need. Uh, a single box, a single transaction, a single block may contain. Uh, we see that in the case of scenario number three, which has the four separate pair ledgers, therefore we, we don't uh, push the limits of any single blockchain uh, by applying way too much gas uh, gas cost on it. Uh, we see that that uh, scenario manages to process uh, boxes faster, while others are a bit slower, quite slower. Basically, what we see in this scenario, in this uh, experiment, is that we have submitted 1,000 boxes for each separate scenario. At once, we have let the experiment run, and we have let each system process boxes as fast as possible. So we see that scenario three, with the four separate pair ledgers, will finish in 300 seconds with all 1,000 boxes, while in other scenarios take uh, significantly longer. Uh, please conclude because we are getting yes. to the end. And uh, we're getting to the conclusions. So the conclusions basically, uh, for to conclude with that, uh, we, we uh, observe that uh, using a single public ledger, that's scenario one, is way too expensive. As I mentioned, it's more than 4,000 euros a day. Um, while it offers the highest possible data availability. Uh, using a single shared ledger, that's scenario two, having a sing single shared ledger is definitely the least expensive because you have to anchor only the block hashes of a single shared ledger. Uh, however, it, could, uh, it has a lower throughput compared to the third scenario, uh, especially in case we have many more uh, transport companies and many more, more farmers, etc. That's going to be a bottleneck when it comes to throughput. Uh, having scenario three using multiple shared ledger is seems to be much more appealing with respect to cost, uh, as well as throughput and scalability. It offers better privacy as well, as I explained earlier. So I think this scenario three appears to be the most appealing scenario. And finally, getting to scenario four. Okay, that's uh, this has virtually no throughput limits because you can store, sensor, and handle hand over data as fast as you wish. You know, uh, there is no ledger uh, in, imposed speed limit on that. Uh, however, uh, availability might be hurt, might be a bit lower. And that concludes my presentation. I will be glad. Thank you very much, uh, Spiros. Uh, now we'll have uh, questions uh, for uh, the whole thing, uh, starting with uh, maybe Max and Spiros first, but then everything. Mm -hmm. I, for some reason, I still don't see in the Q&A um, window any questions, but uh, we could have people ask them um, directly, or maybe um, Liz can help us. No? Julie, do you see any questions? Um, none. Maybe we could conclude now. Let's have closing remarks and conclude and conclude the, and wrap up. Okay, let me uh, show maybe a concluding slide and, and then pass it on to uh, 
CyberWatch. Uh, just a second. So uh, I hope that you can see uh, my slide. So uh, we have been uh, looking at uh, exploring uh, blockchains and distributed ledger technology in general as enablers for uh, the IoT and uh, fourth generation business platforms. Uh, they support uh, unattended automatic operation, which is the heart of the IoT in my, uh, in my view. Uh, automatic uh, smart contract enforcement, trust between devices with unplanned interactions. They support decentralized payments and audit trails. Uh, Interledger and uh, multiple blockchains improve uh, privacy, cost, scalability, efficiency, performance, and longevity of the whole system. Uh, SOFI, the SOFI project is driven by uh, its four uh, pilots and therefore it's grounded in uh, real applications and has direct impact in uh, these uh, diverse industries and indirect impact in the whole IoT architecture and, and uh, domain, uh, business platforms, and the areas of identification, uh, privacy, and many others. Uh, of course, uh, major challenges remain. Uh, sustainability and business issues are things to be explored further. Um, blockchains have issues with uh, verifying directly real world events, and therefore we need uh, oracles. We have discussed even uh, decentralized oracles in order to get them also in the decentralized uh, uh, domain. Uh, performance issues uh, are, uh, are, are central, in particular uh, when uh, IoT deals with uh, real-time events. Um, and uh, privacy issues are all over. Uh, public blockchains uh, treat transactions in the open and therefore we deal as uh, we have discussed in, in uh, maybe most of the uh, presentations and in particular Spiros in the end has shown with uh, private ledgers uh, supporting uh, privacy uh, but having ways of also uh, supporting uh, trust. So what makes all of these multiple ledgers to uh, interoperate is uh, interledger and there are different approaches as Santeri has shown uh, at the beginning. So uh, we'll stop uh, here and uh, ask uh, uh, Cyberwatching to maybe uh, close the, the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. So I, I did actually have a question about the, uh, so the can I ask my question? Sure. Uh, it was about the, the discussion on there, uh, in particular on privacy, and because there's some quite interesting uh, questions coming through, in particular on, um, on how much a consumer would pay in their energy bill related to um, how much data the, the electricity provider uh, protected for them. Uh, I thought that was quite a, an interesting discussion. I think it was um, is it Prit, Pirit, Prit. Prit, who, who, yes. meant, who answered yes. that. Yes, I, I answered it partially. It, yeah. yeah, could you just very quickly expand a little bit because that, that was very interesting, the uh, value of... Summarize. Of, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so the question was like... Uh, if you have the GDPR in place, then uh, how would you expect to have the cost for your uh, electricity bill to be uh, bigger? So, uh, like it should be like essentially already delivered. So uh, I, I agree with this, and actually the 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 challenge still remains from the network operators and data hubs uh, side, and and the the means to to deal with that comes with how many data breaches we have and then how many um, 
100 million to more uh, fines they get for for these breaches so it it is something that that uh, as i mentioned in earlier states that that the regulations are in place that's a good thing now these systems have to kind of uh, uh, follow and uh, and then be ready to to deal with that because it's not only like you have a, a certified smart meter in your home and uh, and you create data from that but it's the the full value chain from from the data going through different parties and uh, there are many gray areas in between where there is a possibility of, of somebody doing something wrong. So, so that's, that's the area we are, we are living right now. Yeah, thank that's you. That's, that's very interesting. In particular, you know, the value of the, or the, the value that the, the consumer puts on his personal data on and how it can then be used. Uh, I also want to ask George, what's, so the, the project is coming, you know, your, your kind of, gearing up to presenting your, your final results for the project coming to an end in the end of 2020. So what, what are the next steps for you? Um, in particular, clearly travel and, and things are restricted at the moment. Um, are you planning on any more um, uh, activities like, like this in the, in the future? Yes, uh, actually, we, we continue uh, both our publications, but also now the, the pilots uh, want to uh, extend their dissemination to uh, uh, the real industry and the ecosystem around them. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the, the travel restrictions and the uh, interaction, uh, the face to face interaction restrictions don't help, but we are using technology like this in order to do that. Um, and uh, of course, now the, the pilots are in the final stages of uh, really um, uh, doing the experiments and getting the, the real uh, data in order to do the, the final evaluation and uh, demonstrations. So the project really ends uh, at the end of the year and we have a full agenda until the last moment. Uh, and um, uh, we, we are at a good uh, uh, point where we, we already have results. We understand what is going on very well at this point and we work at, uh, at full speed. Wonderful, thank you, George. And it was very, it was very interesting to hear how the you know the the activities in particular with, with with energy and the was was impact on the societal challenges you know the on you know making savings uh, which can energy savings which of course have an uh, an impact on the on the environment and then also the essential the cross border nature of some of these activities and the uh, and also well, covering different countries uh, and you know one uh, one countries connect the food supply chain uh, and also it was very interesting about the gaming as well which I think everybody uh, yes. as soon as the word gaming comes up it's it's interesting stuff isn't it so so thank we you um, we have been able to do a demonstration during our uh, mid project uh, review of uh, actual electric vehicles uh, balancing uh, the grid in uh, in Italy oh. And, oh, fantastic. Uh, so we were uh, uh, lucky to be able to do it before uh, COVID nineteen. Ah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that would have been a that would have been a problem. Yeah. That would have been a problem. So uh, thank you very much, and thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, thank also to to I think it's Liz from your team who set this up with us. Uh, so very very uh, grateful for you to uh, to 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 run this, and uh, thank you to all the speakers and also my colleagues at Trust IT for running this behind the scenes very smoothly. And thank you uh, so much just, for giving us this opportunity and this uh, smooth uh, webinar. It's a, it's a pleasure, it's been very good. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. So obviously for more information uh, on Sophie, then there's the, the Sophie website. And I was, I was looking at your website and I found, you know, the, the GitHub, uh, for, you know, the open source results uh, also listed. We'll have all the presentations uh, and the record, well, have all the presentations up uh, this afternoon. Uh, the, recording will, the recording of the session will be available tomorrow. 
uh, at the latest. So you, it might be up at, at some point uh, today, if we're lucky, but probably tomorrow. Also, the results are in the, the cyber watching marketplace as well, with with uh, uh, just under 120 other results from from projects and also from uh, startups and innovating who are innovating in the cybersecurity space. Um, next. Next slide, Julie. I also wanted to highlight um, the, uh, an activity happening uh, in Europe because blockchain's been mentioned a lot uh, throughout, the, throughout the session. Um, and, and, and this activity looks at uh, unlocking the potential. I'm going to read it. The unlocking the potential and harnessing the benefits of blockchain and, and, uh, and distributed uh, ledger technology. So. Uh, in, uh, in Atba has been has been recently recently founded with many organisations involved. There's a number of working groups as well. Energy is one of them, uh, and also topics like uh, privacy and uh, and identity, which uh, which was covered with the the de decentralised identifiers, etc. In in some of the presentations earlier. So I wanted to just highlight that, and then finally. Uh, Next slide there, Julie, just some events which are coming up. Uh, there's a, a brokerage event for the Sparta project next week, which is one of the big cyber, cybersecurity competence center projects. And that's cyber watching is, is going to be speaking there. Uh, and also an interesting one from a, uh, with talking about COVID. Um, if you're interested in how data protection has been affected in the healthcare sector, then there's a webinar next week on that from the Panacea project as well. And it's very interesting speakers who are dealing with this on the front line in Italy, in, uh, in, in hospitals in Italy. So some interesting perspectives there. And then we've got two, two, two webinars coming up in July uh, with the launch of the radar that I mentioned at the beginning uh, and also COVID related best practices for us working from home uh, as we're all uh, at home, I think. So uh, with that, again, I'd like to thank all of our speakers uh, and uh, and the, the Sophie team and uh, and George and uh, have a lovely day and uh, stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. You. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye.